So we're going to call the uh, State Route 85 Corridor Policy Advisory Board to order. Can I get the roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Member Waterman? Here. Member Sinks? Here. Member Bruins? Alternate Member Lee Ng? Member Rennie? Alternate Member Sayok? Member Turner? Alternate Member Craig? Member Jimenez? Here. Uh, <coughs> Member Klein? Here. Vice Chairperson Miller? Here. Uh, Chairperson McAllister? Alternate Member Siegel? I'm meeting as a Committee of the Whole. Okay, as a Committee of the Whole, under orders of the day, I would recommend that we uh, that we uh, defer any item that's an action item, which in this case is going to be the minutes from the consent calendar. Is everybody okay from that? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, uh, receive a committee staff report. Thank you. I just have a brief report today. Today, just wanted to remind everybody today is the second of the two PAB meetings where we're discussing the tra transit travel market. Um, essentially, this completes the first stage of our study. Next stage of study will be uh, is to develop project alternatives and we'll study those alternatives in a whole analysis section of the study. We anticipate our next meeting will have a workshop format where PAB members and staff will collaborate on potential project designs. So that'll be uh, sort of a roll up your sleeves meeting. And that will be in February in the new year. February 26th is that date. Uh, it's the prerogative of the PAB though if you'd like to schedule a meeting before that. But right now the next formal meeting is on February 26th. Uh, per comments of the last PAB meeting uh, about the accessibility of our proceedings to the general public, uh, we know from those meetings that there's a lot of interest uh, in, in um, what we're doing here. There was a, a, an immense response to our online survey. We had a lot of high public, we had a lot of uh, attendance at the public meetings, and a lot of people requested we share that data, so that will soon be online. We want to be as inclusive as possible on this, so that will soon be posted on vta.org. Lastly, as we prepared our agenda for this meeting, um, it was shortly after the conclusion of the last PAB meeting, uh, we were hoping to get the analysis of the, the video survey data in time to present to you today. That came a little late, so we have a few remarks we're gonna make about that, but we'll be sending that under separate cover in a few days uh, after we have time to analyze it and write a report about it. Um, but you'll be getting that again electronically as soon as we're able to release it. So that concludes my staff report. Anybody have any questions? Okay, moving right along then. Uh, we are skipping the uh, consent calendar item and we are going to do uh, item number six. I had one question. Oh, so please. I think I heard that our next meeting is February 26th, is that correct? Correct. Okay, is, is staff's intention to have meetings like every other month next year? Um, I don't remember what the formal schedule is. Quarterly. Quarterly, yeah. I think that that uh, John and I are going to meet with Chris. We just haven't scheduled it yet. And I think that's one of our topics of discussion is what would be uh, the meeting frequency. We don't want to do meetings that have no new information. Sure. But we don't want to go long periods of time, especially since it's a bunch of elected officials that have to go along with the process that will lose connection. No, I understand it. But I think it falls on John and my shoulders to sort out with, with Chris if the meeting schedule is going to be appropriate. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, for my part, I, I think monthly is too frequently. I think maybe quarterly is a little infrequently, but if we went every other month, it's kind just of a suggestion. Some so of the stuff it depends like, on the, yeah, it depends, it on, depends when on the content the scope rolls of up. the meeting, yeah. One could see a January late meeting under the assumption that all the new members have been appointed, at which point we can do a little bit of a review. Here's what we're doing. Here's what the timeline is. Here's what the schedule is. Just to bring all the a elected refresher. officials up mm -hmm. to speed, yep. assuming there'll be some new members amongst us. Um, but again, I think that's a topic <clears throat> we'll have to sort out with staff. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? Now moving right along to item number six. Take it away. Okay, so uh, I'm Adam Berger. I'm the project manager for this study. Uh, I'll be giving you all your presentations today. Uh, at the last meeting, there was a request from the Policy Advisory Board that we set the stage for each meeting with an overview of where we are in the project process so that the, the PAB members will be better able to, to follow along and understand what their responsibilities are. So I wanted to briefly touch on what Chris mentioned in the opening remarks. 
that uh, we are nearing the completion of the first stage of our process, which is understanding the travel market, understanding the various engineering right-of-way constraints that we have along the corridor. All of this is designed to give you, the PAB, a better understanding of how people are traveling and what the impacts of certain project designs might be. And I encourage you, as we have these meetings, to think about what that means for the types of alternatives that we want to look at in the alternatives analysis. So that workshop type meeting that Chris mentioned would be our next meeting to, or perhaps two meetings from now if we want to do a January review meeting for new members, to uh, think about what sort of modes, what sort of designs uh, we're looking at for project alternatives to study. Once we have those figured out, uh, staff will uh, dig into an alternatives analysis, which will be a multi-month process wherein we will do all kinds of cost operating uh, cost analysis. We will look at uh, some more detailed engineering issues. We will do projections for ridership from our travel model, basically to give you a fair comparison across all of the alternatives, uh, what the various metrics would be so that you can make an informed decision when you recommend to the uh, board of directors how you'd like to uh, proceed on this project. And that's the final step. So uh, we're finishing up with step one today. Uh, encourage you to think about what sort of alternatives you'd like to see uh, in step two. So that's the end of that item. If you have any questions. So that's item number six in its entirety, correct? It's very brief. <laughs> OK, so I have just one question. And I'm assuming that it happens at the February meeting. It's not just the alternatives, but it's the uniform metrics that we want to get data on for all the alternatives that will be discussed in detail at that meeting, sure. right? Are there other questions of staff? I have one public speaker on item number six, which is uh, Connie Cunningham. Welcome. Thank you. Well, um, good morning. Um, my name is Connie Cunningham. I'm a resident of Cupertino. I wanted to express my support for light rail through our area um, based on certainly our um, support through a vote for financial support for the light rail and also to let you know and to encourage you to consider highly the light rail um, option for State Route 85. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And I hope you'll be coming back later in the process as well. Any other uh, members of the public wish to speak on item six? Seeing none, any questions or thoughts? Rod. Are we on schedule, the last published schedule? That's a yes. good question. <clears throat> we are. Adam. Um, yes, we are, because we had an additional meeting in November to talk about the first step of the transit market analysis. We are starting developing alternatives early in the new year, which is what we projected at our September 25th meeting. Great, so best we know we're gonna be, we, we will have completed uh, all the information we need to make a recommendation to the board next fall, correct? Yeah, the potential variability there will be how frequently the PAB would like to meet. When we made our projection in September, we are anticipating quarterly meetings. If you'd like to accelerate that process, we may have I mean, we may wrap up this study sooner. It'll also depend on just how many alternatives you would like us to analyze. The more there are, the more staff time needed to crunch the numbers. Oh, fair enough, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions or commentary? Since this was informational, seeing none, we're gonna move right along, item number seven. Okay, so we did an online study and we now have all the results back to uh, share with you as well as a little bit of analysis. So this study was online for about six weeks, from mid-October to the end of November, and we received uh, almost 2,500 uh, responses, which is just a, a phenomenal amount, considering that we're talking about the potential for a project here. Usually we don't hear these numbers unless we're doing something that upsets a lot of people. So I imagine this will be something we hear a lot more about as we even get in our next stage of outreach, which is just really good for a, a project <coughs> planning uh, process to hear from the community in such large numbers. So let me go through the results here. Uh, we asked a number of demographic questions to get a sense for who we were hearing from and how representative that was of the public at large. So what you see on this slide in blue are the responses that we heard by demographic 
and in red, I've come up with numbers for if the responses perfectly mirror the demographics of Santa Clara County. Now, I don't expect that West Valley necessarily will do that, but I'd like you to have an understanding of who we heard from. We oversampled proportionally people who are middle-aged, slightly more males than females. We received more white or Caucasian input and less Hispanic, Latino, black, or Asian or Pacific Islander input. And we heard a lot more from people who are on the higher levels of the income spectrum uh, than reflect Santa Clara County overall. That may be reflective of West Valley. Um, just keep that in mind that this is who we heard from. Uh, we also heard from a lot of folks who live down in the southern part of the uh, corridor. I don't know if this is just the amount of outreach and promotion that our San Jose partners did, but lots and lots of our respondents live in the San Jose area. Uh, we also have a lot of folks who are traveling pretty far north, Mountain View, Palo Alto, the Stanford area, even north of Santa Clara County, and quite a bit of folks who are going all the way to San Francisco. Perhaps there's a selection bias here in that people who are very frustrated and traveling a long time on Highway 85 are more likely to fill out a survey, but that's uh, who we heard from in terms of travel patterns. We asked people about their trip behaviors today. How are you getting around when you use Highway 85? And about 90% of the folks responded that they drive by themselves, although about 20% of those people also indicated that they use a carpool occasionally. Assuming that they're likely to do that during the commute periods, I've charitably put them into the carpool or vanpool category on the left chart here for primary travel mode. Uh, but um, it really is drive by myself and carpool or vanpool that make up the most people in our survey. We found that about 90% of the people who travel along the corridor <coughs> do it for work in addition to some others. And an interesting finding, about one third of the people who travel along the corridor choose not to travel during the peak period. Uh, just interesting to note. We asked people about their openness to transit and we found that a lot of people are interested in something other than driving on Highway 85. About two thirds of our respondents said they would consider a transit option uh, in the bottom left, or, or sorry, the top right chart there, would you be willing to convert to transit? About half of our respondents said that they were somewhat likely or very likely. Um, I would put an asterisk on that response because each person is imagining a transit service of their own liking when they answer that question. What I think is more interesting is in the bottom left when we ask folks about would you take transit, we find that people are very time sensitive, that once it starts taking more than 25% longer than their current option, they tend to have a very low tolerance for taking transit. Now the interesting thing to note here is as we were analyzing the data, we found that young people were much less time sensitive, uh, people in the 18 to 24 range that may be that they can be on their phones, they can be productive without being at the office. Uh, their time may not be as valuable yet. Um, we also found people who live in San Jose were much more willing to uh, take transit and to spend more time on transit. And I think that can be explained by this chart, which shows uh, the duration of trips that people are taking. And we find that people who live in San Jose who responded to our survey have much longer commute trips than people in other cities. And I think this just illustrates the drive until you qualify uh, aspect to the housing market here, that a lot of folks work in the northwestern part of the county, but they can afford to live in the southeastern part of the county. And so you see proportionally as you get further north into Mountain View, the trip durations are much lower. So we also asked people to imagine how they would get to the station, their access mode, which is their home to station trip, as well as their egress mode, which is getting from the station on the other end of the trip to your destination. And we found that most people imagine that they would take a car in some form or another, whether drive and park at a park and ride, drive and park wherever they can, or take a ride hailing service like a taxi, Uber, Lyft. On the mode of access, about 15% of people were in the taxi, Uber, Lyft, and the rest were in other um, modes of arriving by car, but very little when it comes to other modes, which is quite a contradiction to VTA's current network where about 90% uh, of people arrive at their transit station uh, by walking or bus or other transit mode. That just may be indicative that we have a very commute oriented travel market and uh, the demographics of the folks traveling in this area are a bit different than those of the county at large. On the egress mode, again, a favor, uh, favoring for uh, some sort of car oriented mode, about half of those would be a taxi, Uber, Lyft type service. Uh, 
on the other end, a lot more interest in walking, walking and biking, or taking transit. What's interesting, I think, from these findings is that this really tells us that it's probably not enough to just build stations, that some sort of park and ride component or some sort of kiss and ride, taxi, Uber, Lyft, drop off feature would be a necessary component of future station designs. Before you leave that slide. Yes. Can you explain the very last column? Would not use any of these options. I think. What does that mean? Does that mean they, they're, they're not going to use transit at all? A few people. So only 82% of our respondents said that they would use uh, transit even if it uh, you know, was much faster. So we have about 18% that are just not interested. And I think those are reflected here in the would not use any. These are just the uninterested people who clicked no all the way through the survey. Howard? OK. Howard? Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, I guess I mean, there, there's a lot of us that have kind of a busy day that's not just sitting at a computer all day for eight or 10 hours. So we're having to you know, go between Cupertino and San Jose and Campbell as I do all day, and it's just not convenient to think I'm going to hop on a bus to do that. So, I, I mean, that, that's quite understandable to me, I guess. So you check no for that reason? No, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, I so was trying to just get some color on. So just to be clear, I mean, is this the is this the subset who would consider riding transit? This or is all users. I see. Okay, yes. whether or not they would consider transit or not. So I think I think yeah. he's got it right. And right. There were some people who clicked, I would not use any of these options, and filled in the other option, where they wrote something like, I probably would drive there, but that's just not a choice open to me. So they had a, some sort of clause that they wanted yeah. us to know about. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, uh, when we did our community meetings, we had about 180 attendees across the three meetings, and a number of those folks expressed to us either in comments directly to staff or writing on our, the maps that we provided some sort of hope for what they wanted this project to become. I've summarized those here and broken them down by uh, proportion for each city. Uh, the things to call out, San Jose was very much interested in an auto-oriented capacity adding solution, uh, perhaps representative of the speech that Johnny Camus gave prior to the start of this meeting, welcoming folks, supporting. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so sorry about that. I, I didn't realize he was going to do that. I was a little embarrassed, but I think he means well. Oh, were you there? I was there. Okay. I was there, and I, and I uh, was cringing as he was talking. Um, but uh, not because I disagreed. I just no, thought, no. you know, it should be very objective. You all sure. should present the information, and I shouldn't really be giving my spinning things in the manner that I think it should be spun. So. That's interesting. And then uh, the Cupertino meeting, we talked a lot about light rail in the opening remarks. I think that may be reflected in the, uh, the, the personal opinions there. In Mountain View, uh, Councilmember Siegel just welcomed any, everyone uh, as a fill-in for McAllister and didn't make any comments, and so things came out more evenly, perhaps. So that's it for this so item. If you back up on that slide, I just have to ask, right? There's all these things which in some way are technical. You know, bus rapid transit versus express bus versus improve VTA bus. How would a, an attendee be able to differentiate the, the positive and negative attributes of each one of those items? You know, in the early going, we were trying to avoid the question of what should it be, and right. rather talk about values. Are we moving people quickly? Are we adding capacity? Are we adding more travel options? Um, Folks couldn't help themselves, though, on providing us some input, and we did tell them that everything they told us we would summarize and provide to you. But I'm just wondering, what, what were they told a bus rapid transit solution is, and what were they told an express bus solution is? We did not get into any explanations of that. It would be all their own understanding. So we should probably interpret the three buses in aggregate Maybe. than a specific, oh, look, they, they want to improve VTA buses and they don't want express buses, you know, for example. I would interpret improved VTA bus as preferring to see money spent beefing up the regular transit system rather than being spent in this corridor. But otherwise, I think you can lump together BT, BRT and express bus as a highway-oriented bus solution. But again, if you didn't tell them anything about them, how would they be able to tell what you just said? So did you, did you guys tell them any differentiation of these three or not? We did not define what the modes were at any point in our presentation. It would just be their own understanding that informed their input. 
I think, I mean, having right. attended this, right, the comment that I frequently got is, how would I know which one I prefer? I'm not right. getting any data or anything. Any data. So what I mentioned at the beginning, because so, I also spoke for, what, two or three minutes uh, at the invitation of ETA staff, was, you know, we know that a dedicated transit lane can carry, say, three times the amount of uh, travelers that a single occupancy vehicle lane can. So uh, my remarks might well have spoken in San Jose, might have created a, a much different configuration. But I think I, in our last meeting, right, staff was really clear that no, they hadn't really spent much time educating, and that was sort of deliberate. We're, we were looking for organic remarks. But the next time we go out for feedback, we're going to do a staff is going to go through the, the merits of each of these things, like carrying capacity, you know, what right. could we expect? So give some visioning to this that really wasn't part of, of staff's part yeah, of Yeah, I was, for me, I'm, my brain is saying that there's no way for a mere public person, everybody in this room, we're transit geeks, <laughs> but, a, but a mere normal public person to differentiate BRT from bus from express, unless there was some yeah. context given. And so I probably interpret these as kind of lumping them together a little bit more to say here's people are thinking some sort of bus solution if you're in cupertino they seem a little more favorable about some sort of bus solution well we spent i mean um, we have spent a few years with transit forms and other things here so yeah, but people in, who came to this probably came with some more information than yeah again that, it's the lack you know, of context that would make yeah. it really hard to know which bucket that yeah. i was just a subtlety on that slide i appreciate the data and um you had Go ahead. Two quick points uh, to Member Sink's comment about uh, what people are expecting. When we do get to the second wave of outreach and we do have the alternatives analysis and all the metrics and estimated travel times and costs and everything, right. we're going to be asking the question again of would you use this service? And at that point, folks will have a lot more information to give a very good response. So those questions earlier where I said put an asterisk in it, uh, we should get a, a better shot at those. Yeah. Also in front of you should be a very thick packet of all of the public comments uh, that we received through our online survey and through our public meetings. You're welcome to flip through those to get a sense for what people were actually saying, uh, the public comments from the meetings of which were rolled up into this graph. It's also interesting in the graph that, it, that people didn't seem to favor as a generalized category express lines. But are there any other questions? Then I have a member of the public, LeBron wants to speak. Thank you, so a couple of things. Um, we didn't have the, the presentation ahead of time to look at, and there's no handout, so it's the first time I've seen this. Um, now, going to your question about BRT and Express, I don't even understand why BRT showed up there, because BRT are typically articulated buses that you run in dense urban areas, not in the middle of a freeway, and typically they cannot exceed 45 miles an hour, because I've actually been on a VTA bus from San Francisco to San Jose, and on the freeway they start going like this, so that doesn't work. Uh, so why they, they even showed up there, I've got no idea. And then express buses, everybody understands. They know one and one eighty one. It gets on the freeway, it doesn't stop. Boom! It's actually faster than driving, and that's why I use it. Um, the slide that actually showed the majority of people driving to transit segues directly into the comments I made at the last board meeting, where we have a massive issue right now with the VTA selling off parking lots adjacent to transit all over the county. It's a massive issue. We have to stop this. The, uh, if, any, if anything, we, we have to increase the parking. I mean, uh, Council Member Jimenez is here and will testify that the parking lot on Cotter Road is absolutely full, yet nobody gets on the light rail. And it could be overflow from Kaiser. We don't know. But I can assure you there's a whole bunch of, of people who get onto the private shuttles. And all the private shuttle providers are using VTA parking uh, facilities. So we're basically going to blow away all the private shuttles because there would be no way for people to actually go where the shuttles go. And the only solution out of, out of this is autonomous vehicles. 
But until autonomous vehicles start providing the last mile facility, we absolutely need to have parking near transit. Thank you. Um, Stephen Levin. Thank you. Uh, I came in late, so I didn't hear most of the presentation. I just saw a copy of the information on the back table. Uh, but what I heard, it sounds like some of you are trying to fight the responses that you got from the public and saying, oh, there's something wrong with those responses because they weren't educated about what they needed. The people know what they need, especially people who use 85 every day. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, let's have some transit. But they're never going to take it themselves because they think someone else will use it. Uh, if you people are serious, you'd be riding transit yourselves every day if you think you advocate transit. I heard the further comment, people, be, people need to be made aware that uh, transit lane can carry three times the capacity of a regular car lane. Yeah, it could, but it doesn't. Because people don't fill up those transit vehicles at all, ever. If you want an example, that's the Highway 87. It's got a transit lane, it takes a huge amount of area, in the meaning of the highway, it does not carry very many people compared to the car lights. So you got a working example right here in San Jose of the failure of light rail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Stallman. Jim Stallman, having Hi. seen the uh, figure that 25% of uh, the traffic on uh, 85, or at least from the uh, respondents, is not actual you'll find out from the alluvial, I guess, what uh, what it is. But a large proportion, South San Jose, um, I was just thinking here, sitting in the room, that um, uh, I, I've always thought Caltrain uh, corridor could make a great additional light rail segment. Um, you know, it's going to be electrified at some point. And um, I don't think there's much service south of uh, Deardon. I'm sorry, I don't know the actual schedule of Caltrain, but um, certainly South County only has the one-way service if we, uh, if we exploit it. I know you guys don't want to look at anything outside the 85 corridor, but if you find that a lot of the traffic on 85 is, is not interested in any destination between Cottle and, uh, and uh, Shoreline, then hey, um, these people, especially at the parking lot's full down there, um, there's that Caltrain station, I believe, right there at Monterey, and you know, that, that's something that the, the, the uh, consultants maybe ought to look at. Um, at. At least get some more service on that Caltrain corridor, because you know, 85 can support a certain level of traffic, and obviously it's, it's uh, overwhelmed. Um, if we need to pare down 10% or 15% to make it work, uh, plus uh, the no-brainer of putting a, a second HOV lane there um, between uh, 87 and uh, and one, or at least uh, 280, um, then shoot, that that brings a solution about uh, pretty quickly and uh, without much uh, effort. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Connie Cunningham. If you want to speak, Sherry, I'll get you next. <laughs> Go ahead, Connie. Uh, uh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, yes, I would like to comment on the meeting that we're discussing. I did attend that meeting, and I was surprised that there was no informational information handed out. I, in fact, do not use uh, light rail or anything like that now. From where I am, I use uh, a car. I am, however, very interested in light rail. Um, or in, I even asked the question about the bus rapid transit. I didn't have information on it, like the gentleman that spoke. However, I thought, well, maybe that would work since we have roads already. Um, I understand that perhaps that maintenance for bus rapid transit is more than it would be for light rail. That said, the fact that I don't use it means that I really didn't have all the information that some of these other people have. And yet, I am very interested in light rail because as our uh, area grows in people, we need more options in order to move people. Cupertino, as well as other cities in our area, <clears throat> are struggling with adding housing. I'm very interested in below right market rate housing for our area. That's where my passion derives from. And I think we do need to have options for people to get around 
this area. The fact that our people voted for funding for such a thing in our area means that we would really like to have it here, not take the money and put it perhaps uh, in San Jose or some other city. Um, so I think it's important to think um, beyond the people who are currently using light rail and how to get other people to use it. I foresee me using it in the future because 85 is how I get to my daughter's and granddaughter's house, is how I get to doctor's appointments, but right now there is no such thing. You hop in your car and you go. And so it's, it's silly to say, oh well, these people uh, don't know. And, well, we don't know, and that's what we assume that VTA has a lot of experience that we don't have and we do rely on VTA, but I do want to add my voice to the fact that I think um, we have to be careful that VTA not get enamored with its express lanes or some other method that is currently being used um, and to, um, to really look hard at the kinds of issues like parking that has been brought up that people actually need in that last mile. I went to the transit discussions, that last mile from your house, it is about a mile and a yeah. quarter from thank my house to the nearest yeah. place, um, Th which you. is the Oaks Shopping Center. Thank you, Connie. Oh. We have time limits. Oh, that's too but bad. But I will tell I you this. <laughs> there is okay. going There is thank going you. to be an opportunity when we do have alternatives, where okay. there will be explanations to everybody about what the alternatives mean, where their local stations would be. And then I think it'll be the, a, a great opportunity for people mm -hmm. who don't ride transit to make very yeah. informed feedback and commentary yeah. about the proposed options. And, and right. it'll be much more rich than what you had at this sort of meeting. Right, but I understood that. So thank you and I hope to attend those okay. meetings in the future. I hope okay. you will. Sheriel? I don't see the, the um, tram system on this list of options and if people had had that that on uh, on their list when they took this survey what would they have said about that um, I would like to remind people that the original uh, HOV lane um, to converted to express lane proposal uh, was only going to be able to put that extra express lane up to Cupertino's um, um, Stevens Creek and, not, and no further. And so I'd like to remind people about the, um, the problem that you have when you take four lanes and turn it into three or two lane, uh, three lanes and turn it into two. Uh, we see that on Magdalena coming uh, from the the north every time and it just uh, almost comes to a complete stop there converting those lanes into uh, fewer lanes. Same thing happens when you're coming from Mendocino and you go through Petaluma, the lanes, and it just simply stops traffic up and puts two hours extra on your on your trip. And uh, so we asked the staff, you asked the staff, was there room for that extra lane to go further? And um, I didn't remember we got a, a real hard answer. We, we got some ifs and ands and buts, but we didn't really get a hard answer if that would actually happen. And I suspect that if we actually would turn this, it would add a lane up to Stevens Creek and then stop, we would end up with a even a worse situation than we have on 85 now. Uh, and so I just like to re remind people about that problem because that isn't really a real option. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, 18 months ago, politically, we, we caught on to that very issue and we pushed the issue. And as we convened this, this part of, of the analysis where we're actually gonna have alternatives, one of the very, very first actions that we took uh, was to get a right away look at the entire corridor. So that, pro that study is in process and this isn't the ifs, ands, or buts, maybe it's possible. This is supposed to be the detailed analysis of exactly what it would take. Because regardless of the solution that we propose, I think we've all come to the same conclusion. Stopping at 280 um, is not gonna be an optimal solution. 
So we agree with you, and I just want you to know that we are well underway in actually getting the hard answers that we all need for that item. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I come back to us. What discussion would you guys like to have? Start with anybody who has anything to say. Then we'll start with Rich. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, I, I'll try to keep it brief. The, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a couple of the issues, one I talked about already, which I don't think there's a solution, but it should show up somewhere in the statistics is realistically, I know people may say one thing, but how many people kind of have a busy day and no matter what we do, they're going to want their car or something, it, it may be Uber or something, but something to take care of getting around during the day. Um, more importantly, you know, working with the cities to, so we keep using this term last mile, but it's more complicated than that. Um, as an example, I mean, Campbell only has a little sliver near 85, but it, it's a big area for us for where we either have high tech or we're going to, and that's over where Winchester is. So, you know, we've already got Netflix, which is Los Gatos, and we have Kaiser there, and we have Barracuda Networks, and we're about to put a couple of really, possibly, it hasn't been approved, but large high tech there. So, you know, if we say, okay, that's where um, is a good spot for a VTA station and people could easily walk, but we still have this question, okay, where do people go during the day to, to eat lunch or, or to meet somebody for coffee? Um, we have a few places there, but we have a, a huge downtown full of restaurants. We have the, the Prune Yard, we have Los Gatos, we have downtown Saratoga, those are all great places. So until those get solved, I think a lot of people are going, well, I, have a, I want to meet with somebody at lunch or, or five of us want to get together and they want, somebody wants to get in their car. Um, at some point, it seems like VTA working with the cities has got to address that. Again, I don't want to call it last mile. It's, it's what's an easy way without a big bus, with it, without you telling me I got to take bus A to get over to Campbell and Winchester and bus B to get over and bus C. People aren't going to do it. Thus, they're going to get in their car uh, without a lot of coordination. That's where it is. So I, I think at some point, working with the cities, I know Howard and I have talked about that quite a bit, some kind of a, a local system to get people around to take care of things they have to do during the day that's local. Thank you. I guess we have another agenda item where we're going to receive the, uh, the trip destination trip analysis. So okay. I, I'm, I'm prepared to save most of my remarks then. Um, I would just say, I mean, with regard to the survey, yeah, I think given that people's experience of transit modes isn't, isn't all that informed and rich, and we didn't really provide a lot of that at the beginning of the meeting, um, I kind of take the alternatives. I mean, Shereel talked about um, an aerial uh, option. I mean, all this was user Im input, right? You didn't have categories. You didn't present alternatives. You just said you presented this idea of transit. Um, mm -hmm. What I take heart from is, is page eight here. Um, you know, d despite the fact that I would guess that most of the people in your survey, uh, it's the blue one, yeah. Oh. Let's see. Oh, I have different numbering. Eight in this handout. It's it's all blue. Respondents openness to that that one. Yeah. yeah. So, so despite the fact that my guess is most of the residents of the West Valley, uh, down into the Alm and San Jose and the Almaden Valley, um, don't really have a feasible transit option today. It was very encouraging for me to see that 65 percent uh, would consider transit. And, you know, I think the numbers here, less time, same time, even the 25% longer, it, it's encouraging to me to see that people actually are open-minded enough and maybe frustrated enough with how they're currently getting around the valley that, you know, they're open to uh, something new. So I think to me, right, uh, the, the survey at, on this, uh, the data here, um, is is very interesting and hopeful. Thank you. Very hopeful. Go ahead, Larry. Yes. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, as far as respondents and, you know, as, as far as outreach meetings, we'll talk about, you know, kind of the next stages, you know, focusing on San Jose, um, Mountain View, Cupertino, I think was important, but definitely, uh, you know, from, from at least verbal comments that I've received, you know, other, other locations kind of nearby those, those areas, so, you know, farther south, Morgan Hill, uh, Gilroy, you know, trying to get more respondents to get feedback, you know, at both ends. So it's like, is, is to me is critical. So conceivably, as we move forward, something farther south than 101, also looking at Sunnyvale and, and you know, not specifically Mountain View, but there, as you look at, at the highest point and kind of looking ahead at the next section, um, you'll see that El Camino, which is basically the, the divider between Mountain View and Sunnyvale, is one of the biggest kind of destinations as, as far as that's concerned. So hopefully as we're looking at the next stages, trying to get those sorts of, of residents, um, just looking at, you know, one of the, one of the um, citizens talked about um, Caltrain and definitely Morgan Hill um, and and Gilroy are kind of underserved from Caltrain, but a lot of people still, that's their main, that's their main focus. And I think a certain number of the people on this 85 corridor are, are those kind of long, long haul um, uh, commuters to a certain degree. Um, and lastly, you talk about, we, we talked a lot about um, the, the final mile problem. And it would be interesting to know, you know, it's like, uh, we talk about Uber and a lot of uh, and park and ride. So this kind of the two things of people driving to a certain location so that they can utilize this transportation, and then whether or not they have that alternative as far as um, as far as instead taking Uber or Lyft or, or one of those transportations. Um, there's also the concept of of car share, which I don't think has been captured in any information that I've seen, and it also deals with kind of the the issue of of um, once, you get once you get to work what what you ultimately do and I know certain services certain companies actually provide that like Netflix does provide car share on site for those people that commute either through company shuttles or other transportation to get there so that they can actually utilize that it would be interesting to if that data is available to see what areas of this of the county are actually covered through car share fact, um, um, car share opportunities and companies because you know we're we, we encourage it it is the alternative and it is the if I'm going to use public transportation and I need to take those you know trips during the day if I can't walk to it maybe uber or lyft but but having that that ability to do errands and things of that nature is kind of important but it would be interesting to see if that's data is available out there also we did uh, an inventory of car share services a few years ago as part of our sustainability program. We were okay. interested in seeing if we could actually get car share at our offices, and I may be able to pull some data from that to answer that question. That would be very useful. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm a short, short timer here, so I don't have all the history. Thank Got you. Excellent questions. Thank you, Larry. Sergio, any? I don't, I don't have any questions. just want to thank you so much for the work that goes into, obviously, creating this. And I know we're sort of... Uh, kicking this off and, and I know it's going to get a little bit more um, uh, challenging potentially as, as we start talking about more alternative or the alternatives getting more uh, um, sort of uh, nuanced input from the <coughs> residents and such once we sort of define some of these a little better but uh, just wanted to say thank you for the report. I think everybody's hit all the big points. I, I too am encouraged as, as Rod is there's, there's a lot of people if we had a good solution would be super willing to participate. And, you know, I think both Rich and Larry hit on the same point, which is the, the, the last mile problem really has to get solved. And I do think your comment is, is very insightful about the whole sharing economy. And, and it's bike share, card share, Uber, Lyft, all those things that say I can get onto a, a transit solution and, and be okay on the other end because I can get to the extra stuff I'm going to need to do on the other side. And so I don't know how we do it, but as we look at the first and last mile solutions, I do think we, we need to talk about what some of those alternatives are. It's one thing to say we're going to put XYZ solution on the guideway. 
it's another thing to say that solution will be paired with sort of a back-end solution or front-end solution when you get there. So I, I think um, I, I don't want to end up with a halfway analysis where it's like, here's the best thing we could put on the corridor, but we're not going to talk about the other problems. That's some other project. Because unless people ride what we come up with, we haven't succeeded. So anyway, I think that sort of wraps it up. I think you guys, that's a, it is a good first step. And I think for those who are watching along on and video, keep this survey in context. This was an initial touch with the public and to get 2,500 people engaged enough to, to show up and do stuff and fill out surveys, there's a lot of interest. Great. Those 100,000 people a day out there are really interested in making it better. You know, you know something that's I interesting to me and, and what I've always been curious about because it impacts my life. So for example, my wife works you know, she works at Kaiser in South San Jose, and, and I often have to drive to different meetings. We had three children, and one of the reasons I don't take transit as much is because if something happens during the course of the day, getting to my kids, in a, in a, you know, very, very quickly. And so what I'm wondering is, when we look at, when we analyze some of these things, have we sort of delved a little deeper into why some folks choose to drive? I mean, I, I understand obviously getting from point A to point B time is obviously one component of it, but other factors that influence that, such as family, familial status, and kids, and, and so have we done that, or do we plan to do that? You know, you're hitting on a key point. I don't know that I've ever seen it quantified in a way. What we do know is that one of the inconveniences of using transit is that you are without a vehicle while you're away from home. And a lot of folks who look at services that maybe only run northbound in the morning or only southbound in the evening for those commuter trips are basically going to be stranded or at least they'll have to take a taxi option or come up with something. And the lack of midday trips can be discouraging to peak period trips, which is why some transit systems, I know Portland, for example, operates midday trips just to provide that security during the peak period so you know if you had to get somewhere you could still transit in the midday is likely to be a, a less expedient travel option than driving. And I realize that some families grapple with that by maybe having flexibility within uh, one of the, whether the husband or wife or family member's schedule that allows them to sort of leave and maybe one commutes and, and things of that nature. But if there's a way to capture that somehow, I don't know if, you know, when we're conducting some of these surveys, if, if we can ask that, yeah. if that's an additional, you know, bit of information that we can help, that can help inform some of the data that we're going to be parsing through, I think is important. Because that impacts me, and i got to imagine it impacts many other people in the Valley, obviously. So, thank you. And i got to say, if you can get that data, you will have the linchpin to all transit systems <laughs> in the world, because I think understanding why people feel they can't ride transit would be so enlightening, and not just our project, everything within VTA, everything within the Bay Area, because that's the hard nut. How do we get the rest of the million people in cars in the Bay Area every day into a transit-oriented solution? One more, if I might. Sure, go ahead, Rod. So I just wanted to pile on to what you said about um, biking um, as, a, as a means to complement transit. Um, I was, I, um, a couple months ago, was visiting my son, who now lives in a suburban area of Boston, where there are single-family homes. Uh, an organization called Hubway uh, provides uh, bike shares. You can go on a map and you can you you punch in where you from where you are to where you're going. Um, it'll give you a coordinated trip that includes the transit leg, where the nearest bike share or walking is, and you can evaluate your alternatives. Um, and it it really so this isn't simply for the most urbanized areas of of downtown Boston or or even the next ring out, but it goes, stretches way out to single family homes. It seems to me that, you know, from my, from my single family home, I'm probably gonna be walking or taking an, a shared Uber or Lyft to a transit center, say at De Anza College or across, something like that. But once I've done that, right, between, uh, if I'm getting off, if I happen to be getting off at that location and I want to make my way down Stevens Creek Boulevard, if transit isn't an alternative for me right now or where I'm, I'm going, it's a little off the beaten path. One could imagine bikes being, bike share being a great complement to transit. So I, I agree with Howard's remarks and uh, those of my colleagues to say, you know, 
we're, we don't need VTA to serve uh, all of the areas of our cities, I think, but if we could simply get these uh, well-designed high-speed pipes on major corridors, um, I think we'd all figure out how to fill in the rest. We, In my city, we've put $8 million this year into um, improved, protected bikeways. Um, and it's going to take a while for us to build all that out, but I think we imagine a different future than, than the one we have today. Yes, employer shuttles, um, more uh, safer biking options, walking. I think these are all tools that can, can solve the last mile problem. Thanks. And with that, I think we will wrap up item number seven. Everybody's nodding. We are going to move right on to item number eight. Okay, so this is a really fun bit of data. It's quality of data that I don't think we've ever had at VTA for another project. And so it's very exciting to look at. This is origin destination data that we've purchased from a company called Streetlight. And what they do is they track mobile device location information. And they see that if your device is stationary for a while and then all of a sudden it moves and now you're stationary again, that's likely going from an origin to a destination. They define a trip that way. And they have their own algorithms for cleaning that up as best they can that are proprietary. Uh, they keep a master database of all trips um, well beyond the Bay Area, but we, we just queried uh, part of their database, uh, 12 months of data to get the averages of how people are traveling from one location to another. And you have a handout in front of you that explains how we broke the county up into 41 different zones and looked at, uh, it's, it's the, the way you should look at that is, we asked the question of the database, of all the trips that start in zone one, how many end up in zone five and zone seven? And they give us a proportional breakdown of all the trips that originate in that zone which is great, but it doesn't exactly tell us how many people that is. Uh, they're not able to provide that since this is not a complete sample. So what we did is we used our travel demand model, which is the computer software that's calibrated to real world observed conditions to estimate the propensity of each of these districts to generate trips. And we multiplied the proportional values we got from Streetlight by our own travel models um, to get a sense for just how many people are moving between all these zones. And uh, I should point out that we're looking at trips between all these zones. This is not just trips that occur on Highway 85. Parallel routes like Blossom Hill and De Anza Boulevard are going to carry some of these trips. So we're looking at well more than what 85 carries. So these are our 41 zones, 39 on the map and two more in Morgan Hill and Gilroy. And what we did is we started thinking, how are these folks travel along, traveling along the Highway 85 corridor? And we grouped these into what I call super zones, where we broke them into 13 groups that you see on this slide that were roughly approximated to be adjacent to another station, or, or, or a likely station location along the Highway 85 corridor. And for many trips, this makes sense. For some that are on the borders of zones, people probably would take another trip. It's a little bit arbitrary, but it gives us a sense for how folks are flowing all the way through here. And uh, what we did is we, we then drew all those trips in this alluvial diagram. So I'm sure this looks chaotic at first, so let me explain what's going on. We're looking at about 2.8 million daily trips that occur in the county. And each of those bands represents a flow from one super zone to another super zone. And the thickness of the lines is indicative of the volume of people. Thicker lines means more people are traveling between those zones. Thinner lines means fewer people. And from the perspective of someone who is designing transit service, what I would love to see on this chart are thick lines going long distances, because that tells me there's a strong market of people traveling a long distance where the inconveniences of accessing transit and waiting for the vehicle can be offset by a lot of time in the vehicle, saving time. I'm also looking for the distribution of people along the corridor. Do we have areas that have low volumes, areas that have very high volumes? This can inform the type of operating plan. Are we doing a local service that hits every stop? Are we doing something like Caltrain does where they skip stops or have a local and an express product? So going back to this chart, what I see is that most of the thick volumes are going relatively short distances. And this makes sense. It's probably your grocery store trips, picking up your kid at school, shopping, that sort of thing. 
but we do see uh, some trips that go a good distance. To give you some perspective on what this is, if you imagine the band of trips, the thin line that goes from number 10, all within Expressway, all the way up to the furthest extent of our corridor in the US 101 North area, that band is about 5,000 daily trips. So you get a sense for how many people are moving along Highway 85, and that matches roughly with what we're seeing from our Caltrans and other data, so that's reassuring. We looked at this also in the peak period. That's when we have most of our congestion, when transit is going to be most competitive. In the morning peak, a more definitive flow of people traveling to the north. Again, that band from number 10 up to number one is about um, 1,900 people in the AM peak. And what I also note is that the farther you travel, the more likely you are to be on a major thoroughfare like Highway 85 or De Anza Boulevard. So I think that is really our commuter market that's showing up in those long distance flows. In the PM peak, we see a little bit more of a scattered um, travel pattern. That's because we have our commuters mixing with other folks who don't commute but just tend to travel more in the afternoon and evening. So um, what I take from this is that even though long trips are a small proportion of all these trips, it does look like there are quite a lot of people going long distances on Highway 85. And that tells me that we may have the potential to have a competitive transit service on that corridor if it's designed in the right way. I also note that trips are distributed through many origins and destinations. So if we were to do an all-day service, and looking at that daily chart, I see a local stopping pattern making the most sense. If I look at the AM or PM peaks where we have more of those long distance trips, I think perhaps an express type service or a peak period only service makes sense. Maybe those two service plans get overlaid. Those are things to think about as we get into what sort of service plans we want to match up with different modes in our alternatives analysis. Also, taking into account the earlier presentation data from the survey, this is what I see our customer being and the kind of person we want to design a service that would appeal to. Uh, they're likely to be time sensitive. They likely want to get to the station by automobile. They are people who are making longer trips that are going to be more likely to be interested in a transit service, and uh, they may skew younger. So I don't know if that's Wi-Fi on board or, or whatever helps us capture that. I also encourage you to think about the math of the overall trip times when thinking about time sensitivity. I've got two <coughs> pairs of drive and transit here. One, the first two travel five miles, the next two travel 10 miles, and I've just compared travel speeds. 10 miles per hour if you're driving during the peak period, 25 perhaps if you are on a vehicle that's operating in a dedicated guideway. 25 miles per hour is how fast our light rail service on Highway 87 goes when it makes all local stops. And for the five mile trip, you see 30 minutes driving, 32 minutes uh, when taking transit, maybe not that competitive. But the math switches when you get to a 10 mile trip. Instead of going traveling for 60 minutes, you're now traveling for 44 minutes. Now this is all built on a lot of assumptions. The travel speed of the vehicle and also the amount of time that it takes to access your station, your destination, and the time spent waiting for vehicles. When we get into alternatives analysis, we'll get a better sense for what those values are. But for now, I'd encourage you to think about what we can do to minimize those delays and maximize those speeds. So here's speed. Uh, our VTA light rail, just for background, goes about 45 miles per hour in its fastest segments. Our express light rail train on 87 goes 35 miles per hour, hitting two stops, and the local goes 25 miles per hour. Buses have the potential for a higher travel speed. We assume that they would be roughly the speed limit. If they have a dedicated guideway, if they're sharing that with traffic, uh, it would be less. So, yeah, what I mentioned before, uh, think about how to minimize the access, egress, and waiting times. And the thought I have here about the flexibility of bus service comes from a comment that John McAllister made at our last meeting, which is thinking about how we can get into the employment areas north of Bayshore. If you have a light rail that has to be on rails, it can only go where the rails are, which gives it a very limited flexibility. If we have a dedicated guideway that operates bus service, the bus can obviously extend beyond the corridor, deviate off the corridor. It may help us match up uh, more with um, what the travel markets actually are if they don't happen to perfectly follow the Highway 85 corridor. And also, um, consider how we can maximize the convenience of getting to the station. And perhaps that is park and ride or kiss and ride type services. 
So that's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. So just a couple questions. Um, sure, the bus speed is 65. Did you do the computations for including stops? We don't have any uh, examples of that in our county. What I see, though, is that light rail gets slowed down by about 25 miles per hour when making local stops, so I'd make about the same assumption for bus. So consider 45 the top speed for bus when making local service. Yeah, I think um, it's percentage of time stopped, number of minutes stopped versus number of minutes going. Somebody could do the math, I could do the math, but I think you guys probably should figure out a model for if, take the 87 corridor, right, because you have the data for light rail and say if it were a bus and the stops were just as long as we currently have to stop for light rail to onload and offload the bus, here's what the effective time would be. I think it's going to matter to us a lot because that's going to that's going to have a lot to do with how the routes come out. And the second question is a little bit more convoluted. We have the different zones, but I am wondering about all the people that are entering and exiting um, on 880 and 17. Um, just my observation out on the freeway, a lot of people a lot of people get off at Union and Camden, I got that, but a lot of people are getting off at 17 in the, in the afternoon heading the Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley side. Is that data possible to access or is it included in that? We only have data from the zones that are shown on the map. Uh, if, if, if we were to make a more expansive query of the database, we would have to pay for a new query. So we're, we're limited. I can't answer your question perfectly. So where is, because these people come, are coming somehow, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to say, because they're somewhere between eight and nine for the zones, because that's where they're getting off. Where do they go? They're in, they're, wait a minute, so they're in different data sets. They, they may not be in the phone data that we got, but they are in your data for entering and exiting the highway. We can use our travel demand model to estimate these flows. It'll be a projection. This data is actually existing, collected, occurred uh, trips. We just don't have such an expansive set of zones to analyze to answer that question. Yeah, I get the zone part, but I'm really thinking off-ramp data. Don't we have off-ramp data for the whole 85 corridor so we know how many people are getting onto and off of 17? relative to getting off at Union and Camden. You guys presented this about a year ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah we do yeah. We do have that. It, it does mix on 17. But yeah, we, we can, there's loop data we can get from Caltrans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, in a way, I think that that's sort of relevant. This is not the only possible source of data. I think this gives us some picture. <clears throat> I think that some of the other pieces of how many people are getting on and off at each off-ramp uh, gives another view of the same data and it will fill in the the 880 split right i didn't mean to preempt with that question but anybody have other questions and then i have a member of the public who wishes to speak rod go ahead thank you let's see so we have all of the for all these zones we have who's going where and then to produce this this picture you're you're trying to aggregate the data multiply by factors that you know about to come up with where people are getting on and getting off the freeway on 85 right these, I'm just trying to understand the data these are more. trips between zones they are okay. not explaining how people travel on highway 85 that's certainly in here but it's mixed in with all the other trip patterns and trip modes so that for we see on other streets. Yeah, for example, you, some of these people are on Highway 9. Even if they originate in Saratoga and they end in Mountain View, they go Highway 9 and down De Anza, you know, to Sunnyvale. And okay. that would show up as a Saratoga to Sunnyvale trip. It doesn't mean that they got on Highway 85 in Saratoga and got off at El Camino. No. It just means that they got there. And what the, we can and these do... Are the, this is data between what you called on the map super zones? Yes. Okay. And what we can do in our query is 
sort of dissect this, we set up a number of zones called pass-through zones at various points, points on Highway 85, so we can see how many people are coming from each zone to each zone that happen to travel through there. Uh, we can do that analysis, we just didn't have it ready in time for today's meeting. And you could break it down into the smaller zones, I guess, as well, if we wanted to get more granular or not? We could, then it just becomes a very complex alluvial diagram. I see. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, well, it, this is really very interesting. Um, yes, it may help us figure out where we might best have stops on a corridor. Uh, and I mean, I, to, the, to the point of um, you know, how long things take, I think what you've told us is that our light, current light rail technology operates at maximum 45 miles an hour, so it just can't go faster than that? Is that a technical yeah. limitation of the vehicle? No, we can go up to 55 on okay. the sections of 87 is the, is the maximum it can go. Okay. 55. Okay. But it, I think our, um, Adam was showing sort of the averages through that section with the stops. So the average with stop is 25, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that was right? the local. With, with all local, 35 on the express stopping pattern. 35. And when would it go? How do you get to 45 then? Where, where does that number Between. Come from? Uh, you would, it's just an average of the entire travel time, including delay. So a longer distance, a faster travel speed, <coughs> fewer stops would get a higher average speed. So, I'm still not getting it. What's the 25 versus the 45? Uh, 45 is about the top speed that our light rails reach. The technical limitation is about 55 miles per hour. When you introduce stops into the equation, the average speed on the local gets down to 25 miles per hour. Even though it may hit moments of 45 between them, the overall distance divided by time equation ends up at 25 miles per hour. So why wouldn't you operate at a peak speed of 55? Is it that the the, 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 the distance between stops is so short that the, the vehicle just can't get up to 55 or it takes too much energy or what? No, I'm not sure the exact reason. It, 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 it's, it's actually your, your first um, comment about the, the, the distance between stops. So, you know, once you accelerate and decelerate and what's your average yeah. between those stations, even though your top speed might be 55, you're not going 55 the whole stretch of that. So let's just play uh, what if, if you took out half the stop, say, on the 87 corridor. I mean, I've heard a lot of transit experts say we got too many, and that's why it takes so long. If you took out half the stops, would you, would you be running those things at 55 peak speed? Y yes. I mean, we run 55 peak speed now. You would just be running 55 for a longer stretch of time. Okay. We still have to, and this is... Uh, a, a safety requirement even if we're not stopping at a station when we go through a station we can't go through at 55 we have to slow down to 35 I see so even if we're not stopping there we still slow down okay that's helpful and and then um, if you were to get rid of half the stations what would that average of 25 get up to 35 because that's the difference between local and Express Generally, yes. So, right. for instance, unless we do there have were fewer, unless there were just fewer stations, you, you wouldn't have to slow down going right. through. You so mean we, remove the stations? Yeah, completely. I mean, like yeah. bulldoze them. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I, I'm okay. not. <laughs> That's a different, well, quite different answer. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm. I mean, the reason I'm asking is obviously we're using it as a, a surrogate for what, one of the alternatives on 85 could be. So I was curious to know if we had. Half of the number of stations per mile. Let us For come 10 back. miles on, on, you know, the corridor, what sort of average speed you'd get up to at that yeah. point. Let us come back with the specific information yeah. on Highway 87 because we do have, we do run local service on 87 and in the morning we run uh, express trips so we can show you uh, the, the speeds and the time savings for those trips. Yeah, but I, I, think be, I mean, my, my interest more specifically is in, okay, we, we have the corridor, the new corridor we're talking about here, mm -hmm. and if we built f fewer stations every 10 miles, say half uh, by, by a factor of two, 
um, so that the train didn't have to slow down to go through stations that it doesn't pick up anybody at at 35. <laughs> right. So we just made the thing run at 55 more frequently. Um, yeah. and, what and sort of average speed could we posit? Right. It and what go? we would do, and those, those are the kind of, um, let's say, sub-alternatives that we would look at when we start looking at light rail, because we would put that into our transportation demand model, and it would say, yes, you're going to pick up more people by going faster, but you're also going to lose some group of people because they don't have that closer station access. Sure, or we'd, and we'd that, need a more yeah. extensive last mile connection to the right. fewer stations, right? So, so it, right? Run, it runs those numbers and, and you know, we'll be able to produce numbers that show you what the, the sort of the, the benefits of either version yeah, are. You guys have the acceleration, deceleration in the bus, or the station time from the 87 corridor. So you guys could give us a model that said if it was one mile between stations, two miles between stations, three miles per oh, between yes, stations. Yes. There you go. I think if we had a little table that said all that, I think it would help us with sort of the intuitive element of, boy, we could go, we could go this fast. And we all know what the curve looks like. A lot of stations, it's going to go really slow. And there's going to be sort of a knee of the curve you know, where you start to get up to that 45 and, and it's going to have to go a long distance to get up to 50. But I mean, for us to have that intuitive thing, I think a table could be built with the profile yeah. we have right now. Sure. And these questions are perfect for the February 26th workshop that we're planning. Uh -huh. I, I plan to arm you with a bunch of data leading into that about um, just what can be achieved on each of the travel speeds. And when we look at the different alternatives, we can look at some with many stops, with few stops, and see how those compare at the end of the analysis. Well, I, I, let me just express my appreciation for you having gone out and gotten, having pulled the data and then factored in your model. I think this is a, a very informative um, and, and helpful for us to consider how we. Any other questions of, this. of staff? I have one public speaker. LeBron, you want to roll him? You want to come? Thank you. So to um, members thinks the uh, one of the comments you made at the last point, um, you should look at bike super highways in London. You can look them up on YouTube. It's faster than transit because they don't stop anyway. They're blasting through London at close to 30 miles an hour. Um, now looking at this, um, I've got many problems with this. Now when you see this massive blob that says Almaden Expressway, well, guess what? That's the whole of Almaden Valley, because there's absolutely no other way for these people to get out of there. So this is why you get this massive blob there, and that's basically where everything chokes up, both 85 and 87. Um, so that that needs to be addressed, you know, for these people to be able to get down there. Um, I've got a real problem with both US 101 North and South. I've got no idea what happened there, but that <laughs> clearly does not reflect what's going on there. Um, it, you know, it's just too small. You know, what is this? I mean, it should be bigger than anything else. I mean, you think there's 15,000 cars coming just from Gilroy. And then I'm seeing that um, somehow Cutter Road is like three or four times bigger. That just doesn't pan out. And, and, and my question, is this really an origin and destination survey? There's something I'm missing there that uh, I'm not happy there. It, it, it doesn't sound right. Now, on the light rail, let me explain to you how this actually works, because you didn't get the right answers on the VGA. The, the maximum speed for the light rail is 55 miles an hour. And it gets there really, really fast. They actually really, really fast. The, the problem is when they have to go past the station. They have to slow down to 45 miles an hour. Now, how do I know? Speedometer. And actually, if you look at the end of the platform, there's a yellow sign. Whoops. Really? That, that, that says 55, which means after the platform, they can accelerate to 55. And before that, there is another one. Let me just close up. Um, if you use Street View, the Google thing actually captures those signs. So you can use Street View on the freeway and look at the signs and see all the speed limits at all the stations. Perfect. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Stephen? While Stephen's coming up, Roland, really quickly, it sounds like on off-ramp data,
but it's really zone data. It's not where they're traveling to. So you. Being a light rail user, I can answer some of the previous questions. By taking the express light rail on 87, you save a total, a grand total of four minutes by skipping six stations between South San Jose and downtown. Makes no difference. As a light rail user, I do not time it to get the express light rail. If I, if I happen to be there and the express one comes, good, I save four minutes. It's not worth timing a trip for the express line. Uh, on this chart, uh, I, I think you already brought up a little bit, I, and, and I sort of asked Adam about this too. I think somehow what people think is Almond Expressway probably includes 87. Uh, what people think is Bascom and Cetra probably includes 17 and Cetra. So I think it's being misleading by not including the, the freeways in there. Disagree with Roland, it's not all people just from Almond Expressway that are making that huge bar there on, on the chart. Uh, I'd like to address some of the issues why people don't take transit, including why you don't take transit. Same reasons no one else wants to use it. First of all, the chart that Adam had on, on his page 12 of his slides, you got the wait time. You got, it's, not, it's not the first mile, last mile. You might start several miles from where the light rail is. You might have to go several miles away. So it's think first mile, last mile is really simplifying the, the situation. Uh, people aren't going to point to point. You know, very, no one's starting, I live right near somewhere on 85 and I'm going to somewhere else right next to where it is on 85. They have to go off of 85. Uh, it's convenience, which is why people don't use transit. Uh, most people like the environment of sitting in their own car, turning on their own radio, doing whatever they want right in their own messy car environment or clean car environment. They don't want to be on a, on a, a vehicle with other people. I hate to say it, but people don't like being people around people who have different economic status, way different hygiene than most of us might in this room probably have. Uh, people's mental state can be considerably different. You have people talking themselves, talking imaginary people aren't there. Uh, I know, undependability transit, late service, missed connections, cancellations, need to go somewhere in the middle of the day, need to stay late at work, unpredictable end time at your work, transfer times, and when you want to take a light rail vehicle, you can't time yourself to, I'm just going to show up one minute before it gets there, because you might miss it. So you have to show 10 or 15 minutes before it gets there just to make sure you get on it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll come back here for comments or discussion. Oh, Sheryl, please come on up. You can turn a card in after all. We'll, we'll complete the record later. Uh, as you know, I go to San Francisco quite a bit because my granddaughter is there and I tend her quite a bit. And in, in the, her first five years, I was there twice a week. And I had to drive to Daly City, park at Daly City, hope to heck there was a parking place there and then get to San Francisco. So I use transit. When I'm in San Francisco, I use transit. And it's because I can get places that I need to go. That's it. Thank you, Cheryl. Anybody else who wishes to speak? Now seeing none, I'll come back to us. Anybody have any further comments? Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, um, since um, this is, I think will be my last meeting. I haven't been here that much. Um, but. So I just wanted to make sure I'm representing Campbell on the issue of, I think a couple of you are talking about of expediency versus uh, where things exit. I mean, I believe, I, I think there's no exit on Winchester on 85 now, right? Isn't that right? Which way you're going. Yeah, which way you're going. But I think the way I usually go, you have to go to Saratoga and it has been pointed out if you're going at the right hour and everybody's going to school, that's backed up and it'll take you an hour just to get off the freeway. So, um, and the more important thing is what I was talking about before. We're doing a lot of plans in Campbell, as is Los Gatos, as to what goes on at 85 and Winchester, um, including, I think you guys have heard Los Gatos with the North 40 and we're doing a lot of planning for uh, the Del Ave area and we've already got a lot of high tech. So. I, I get nervous when I'm hearing, uh, let's take things off. I, I suspect Saratoga would be, Saratoga Ave would be a higher priority um, as with some of the other ones, but it's important to us, at least we know sooner than later, is there a solution that would include Winchester? Of course, that's gonna bring us to that full circle of, now it's gotta stop 
I suspect somewhere near Highway 17, 880, and then it's going to stop at Winchester, and then it's going to stop at uh, Saratoga, and all those are going to be express routes. <laughs> but uh, representing Campbell, I think it's really important to us that there is some kind of a egress, ingress to get on an office for, uh, for Winchester. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Rod? Well, I'll, uh, now I'll pile on, on your comment. I mean, I think the data shows that Winchester is actually a healthy trip generator. Uh, it's also the nexus of 17. So for people that would like to access a transit option um, coming over the mountain, say, it seems like it would be really important. You have Netflix, or, or Los Gatos does. Um, so besides the, the, the work that, that you're doing, the tech jobs that are down there, um, yeah, it seems to me to be um, a real not point. I mean, I'm also impressed with all of the the generation from the Almaden Valley. I mean, I think what folks in South County might be, the, so folks in South County actually do have an option, right? They could get, if they're commuting, they can get on um, Caltrain. And yes, there are only, what, three Caltrains every morning? Mm -hmm. VTA recently started a, an express bus that goes up the 85 corridor but doesn't stop along it, right? right? How's the ridership there going? Uh, it's still growing. It takes about two years before we say yeah. the route has matured, but it is one of, it, it is currently our worst performing route. Yeah, and I mean, frankly, right, we've talked about this. It's not a big surprise given that you're competing with Caltrain for, for riders, but boy, you know, I guess if I was, uh, I was trying to get to Sunnyvale and I had a coming driving from the South County and I had an option of 85 or 101 of course ways would tell me which way to go but um, frankly right th there is a choice there but from the heart of the Almaden Valley I would think you'd you, as this chart is showing right there is massive uh, a massive uh, mobility need from that area up to cities like Cupertino and Mountain View and Sunnyvale and so forth, so. Yeah. I clarify that the way that we drew the zones, just yeah. picking out large blocks, we had to attribute them all to one station location or another. So it's likely that yeah. all of those folks in the Almaden Valley, some would go to neighboring Bascom, some would go to neighboring Blossom Hill. Sure, yeah. yeah. Right, so, so these, these are, if I take number nine, for example, and I look on the map, these are people that are starting their trip someplace in number nine, mm -hmm. and then going up to wherever they're going, right? Right. So, and w we know what's happened, right? Uh, 85 has become such a bottleneck that people are now uh, inundating our surface streets. So, yeah, some that 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 roadway reaches capacity, and then people transit through. Uh, all the streets in Sunnyvale and Cupertino and you know <laughs> Saratoga Campbell and yeah exactly so this also includes the people who are on transit mm -hmm. fortunately we know what that is and not that would include uh, corporate buses too corporate buses, yeah no I, um, that that's correct right this is it does not discriminate by mode so every every mobile device that moved gets picked up I see so it's picking up data from Google and Waze, and I guess Apple has a map service it's, too, right? It's your cell phone location data. Okay. <clears throat> how, do they, how are they allowed to collect this information? Anonymize. They do, and it's your option to turn it off on your phone if you don't want to be tracked. So all of the cell phone service providers um, they get the data from all those cell phone service providers. Right. Okay, so it's not going through a, a mapping app. It's no. that raw no, data. No, it's from the cell phone provider. Okay. Yeah, the provide this company buys it from the providers and then <coughs> uses different tools to provide it to us. Well, super interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, <coughs> Larry. Yes. So. Definitely, I haven't, you know, I've, I've read a little bit about the streetlight data and, and some of the questions that I had were, you know, how accurate its, its orig origin and destination 
numbers are because it's like you look mm -hmm. at a a corporate shuttle and it conceivably might take multiple exits off and and whether or not you know as it, if it's moving from like the Elmwood and Valley to to Apple um, it might take several bus stops before it actually gets to the final destination and whether or not that actually is seen as the final destination so I'm assuming that that Heuristically, it looks at how many hours you're spending, you know, your overnight time and your and your daytime. Um, I know that you only focused on Santa Clara County, so when we talked about 17 and, and 880, um, was there any any possibility to look at ori origin, you know, origins from Santa Cruz or or something of that nature? Um, yeah, we. We had options for how robust of a data package we wanted, right. and we picked one for nine thousand dollars that limited us to these forty zones. So okay. we, we could have gone bigger, but we we went middle of the road. So okay. I, I I can't from this data source quantify those trips. We can look to other data sources like the Caltrans PEMS data from the freeway loops. We can look at what our travel demand model is showing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a, a perfect number for you. Okay, because yeah, because I have, you know, I know people who work in Sunnyvale that that come from Monterey, stop in stop in Morgan Hill, you know, pick up pick up the Caltrain and end up in, in downtown San Jose or downtown Sunnyvale. But similarly, depending upon what service is provided here, that same capability of coming over Route 17 and stopping in. Campbell, Los Gatos, you know, San Jose, wherever that, wherever the appropriate starting point would be and doing a park and ride sort of thing would be a definite possibility here and, and understanding how many people are coming over the hill and targeting these similar zones would have been useful, but I understand mm -hmm. the, the resource limitations. Other than that, I want to thank you very much for this data. That's you know, it, it does give you a visual representation of at least to some degree, you know, a, a, a feel for where things start and end. And yeah, we're missing a certain amount of data and, and numbers, but, but I, I, I do agree, this def definitely helps you visualize um, how transit or, poss or possible, you know, public transit routes might actually take place. So thank you very much. Sergio? I have no comments, thank you. Yeah, so we'll just wrap this up pretty quick here. You know, as we try to understand in, in great detail what's going out on the road, there is no one way that you could see the whole problem. It, you know, every measurement is looking at one part of the elephant. And I do think the loop data is probably pretty complementary to this and probably gives us some more corridor specific data, give us some insights to potentially those coming over the hill. Um, and I think it, all these data sources aren't giving us the answer. All these data sources are just giving us more context. So as we come up with answers, it, we can validate those answers against what we think people are doing based on these data sources. So while I love the data, I think it's super, super, super interesting. I don't think these, these alluvial diagrams let you design a transit system. I think they help you analyze possible solutions um, from a certain perspective and I think that's super useful and it is super good to have this detail of data um, But just for everybody who's watching at home. This is not the only data source It's not the only way to measure the way people are moving around. It's not the only way to measure who's potentially could use transit on Highway 85 So I just keep that in mind and then Adam you got any final comments for us before we close this I would just say that as you start thinking about the potential for what a project could be, we always start at an extremely high level. Where should it go? What mode should it be? And then we start getting more specific. We pick alternatives, we analyze those, we put those through more rigorous data analysis. So we're right now transcending the high level to the medium level uh, to do our alternatives analysis. I presume at the end of that, this body will make a recommendation. If that moves forward through VTA's board, we'll get into environmental analyses, which will be even a more fine-grained, lower level, even more alternatives analysis. So just to keep in perspective where we are right now in the process. Great. Oh, Larry's got something else. I, I'm sorry. You know, as I was looking at the data, sorry, as I was looking at the data um, a little bit closer, um, 
I had a question. So are we, from a, from a data standpoint, you're looking at origin and destination, mm -hmm. are we sure that, they've, that they actually trans, that they, transportation mode along 85 corridor was part of this? Meaning, meaning, you know, I look at like zones between, especially like Almaden, nine and 10, if it's from one zone to the other and just went over 85, or, or did it actually go along the 85 corridor? Meaning, meaning if, I'm, if I'm going two miles within the same zone, was that also captured in the same data? So this is all trips. It doesn't say at all how fast the person traveled or what mode they traveled. I look at the longer trips and think that it's more likely that that was an automobile trip and one that likely went along a major thoroughfare like 85, right. but it could have been a very avid cyclist going up through the Saratoga Cupertino Hills at a relatively low speed that finally stopped moving for a break sometime around North Bay Shore. Okay. So there's a little bit of that in there, but by and large, looking at how people travel in this county our automobile mode share is like well into the 90 percent so this is mostly auto trips okay it was it was just uh and not specifically auto trips but but because you have such big zones of nine and ten and looking at the usage of those super zones um somebody that that drove that drives to the library every day or something within that same zone or or that split zone because it is kind of a mm -hmm. as far as where that where that boundary was made is actually captured as a as another trip potential trip along 85 and that so, was but what i don't see here is i don't see any band that starts in 10 and ends in 10 for example no, we, right we removed so within a zone you're not those trips aren't included it's we just removed all trips between trips. zones whether or not they had anything traveled on 85 or not is, I, I presume that if you were just traveling within your zone and were going to be close to the same potential light rail station that you would have no need or a potential bus station to get on that corridor I understand. It's just it was just looking at at how the super zones were created, and you have a yeah. large areas where you could conceivably go, you know, two miles east west, and never be close to 85 and be captured as as you know as yeah. those big destinations between super zone nine and super zone. 10. Yeah. So so, so and, that, and that's on. Yeah, Los Gatos to Saratoga to go to the junior college, for example. Those are probably Highway Nine, uh, Quito Road. Um, yeah, right. so those thousand people probably aren't shown as 85. Correct. And, and we know there's 20,000 people that come over Highway 9 in the morning past our fire station and pour down into Cupertino, probably on their way to Sunnyvale. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a fair point. You might think about whether it, it's warranted to split 8 into an 8A and 8B and 9 into 9A and 9B, maybe conveniently just taking, you know, I think a more refined look at this and maybe yeah. seeing okay. what passes through along Highway 85 will shed some more light on this. I know when we think about the corridor, we tend to think in a very linear fashion here, but there are trips from downtown San Jose to downtown Saratoga that would have no interest in this transit service that are appearing in our matrix. Yeah. So, so if I was in, in the there. southern end of 10, right, mm -hmm. I might well consider a trip up 85 mm -hmm. and a transit trip. If I was in the northern part of 10, I'd it would be uninteresting to me. I'd be taking 280. Yeah. Right. And we, we have weighted these by propensity to make a trip from one zone to another zone, so it should minimize the effect that like downtown San Jose trips have on the overall total, but they're still in there to a small extent. Okay. Well, Thank I, you. I think it's a really a fair point that you make to maybe get a little more granular in those zones that are... Yeah. Any other questions, yeah. commentary? Then let's consider this item closed and... Um, item number nine, um, which was the video survey. You guys actually don't have that for us today. Well, we, we got that data at 7 p.m. last night. So I can so, just tell you some very high-level things about it and that we will provide a more detailed analysis. Then let's get the three-minute overview and we'll <laughs> defer the bulk of item nine to the next meeting. Three minutes may be too generous. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say that we, we set up videos uh, cameras at about six locations along Highway 85 and some poor soul had to watch all of that video and count the number of vehicles going by. Uh, what we found is that uh, there's quite a, a good amount of tech bus activity along the corridor. Depending on your location, uh, I'll say El Camino Real was the highest. We saw upwards of almost 300 tech buses 
in the AM peak period go through that area. Uh, 90 per hour at the 60 minute interval that had the most buses. So that is quite a lot of vehicles. It's been very difficult to get any information from tech companies about how many people they serve. We've tried reaching out to the leadership group, the Bay Area Council. We've contacted uh, transit or traffic management agencies, associations as well. This is very proprietary information, how much they spend on their employees, and they are not very excited to share that data with us. Just for a high level sense, if we did have uh, say 90 buses per hour going by in a corridor, we would need to have about 20 people on each of those buses to make the equivalent volume of people equal to what you see in a travel lane. So whether we'll get that information or not, we don't know. But uh, it does suggest that there is robust travel by express buses. At some point, it must be worth it for these companies to operate them. And uh, in speaking with the leadership group, we heard from some folks who request to be anonymous that they are considering cutting routes that do not have sufficient ridership. So cost does matter to them at some point. So that's it. We'll provide more detailed information uh, electronically. And we will get detailed information when you guys have the time to analyze it. And that will be presumably at our next meeting. Any questions? Roland wishes to speak on this item. Yeah, I don't know. This is very brief. I don't know if the videos captured this, but to the question, I forgot who asked this, about who is competing with the VTA on the 101 to Giroy. The answer is very simple. It's called van pools. I don't know how many of these systems are operating, but, but people clearly cannot afford to Uber, I mean, on that kind of distance. But they can certainly afford, you know, to pull together and get onto a van pool and service actually profitable. So I don't know why we're running a 185. Thank you. Stephen? Thank you. I just want to start by saying I appreciate Adam's presentations today. Uh, I think we're making too much of the super zones. If you look carefully at your map, uh, Super Zone 10, which you all think is Almaden, actually borders Super Zone 3, which is labeled El Camino Real. So I think in most of your minds, Almaden is not where El Camino Real is. So, you know, I think, uh, I, I'm sure I can explain better, but probably the Super Zone is maybe the whole length of Almaden Expressway, and El Camino Real is the whole length of El Camino Real. And you're making too much of the so called people from Almaden in what you're talking about. But I will talk about Almaden. Uh, in fact, there is rail service. There's an Almaden light rail station right now. Uh, and there are, there, the South San Jose area near Almaden is served by two different light rail lines. There are light rail stations, for those of you who know where these are, the Almaden light rail station, Oak Ridge, Blossom Hill. There's a major intersection point for the light rail lines at Ohlone Chinoweth. So there is light rail there. And we have, we have Caltrain, we do have rail service. You can get from South County and South San Jose to Mountain View on rail, which is Caltrain. You can take light rail from Almaden up to Sunnyvale, Mountain View. We have all that stuff now. And guess what? It's not well used. That's the point. So all this notion that somehow by putting light rail in the 85 corridor, you're gonna, you're gonna solve some kind of problem. People are not gonna use light rail in the 85 corridor. I'd also like to mention that VTA already runs, I believe, uh, like uh, three express commute transit routes from Almaden north to uh, these uh, Sunnyvale, Moffat Park, uh, Mountain View areas. Uh, there's about four express uh, and commute type buses going from other parts of South San Jose up to those areas. There's two from Gilroy. Uh, you already have transit service. So anyone that thinks, oh, you can't get from South San Jose, you can't get from Almden, you can't get from Gilroy Morgan Hill up to Mountain View, Sunnyvale, whatever, by transit. It's totally wrong. It's there. It's not well used. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That's what makes this project so exciting and so complicated, is many of us have our favorite modes of transportation, and we all have our theories. Um, but this is a structured process by which we can put all of those favorite modes of, of transportation side by side with some objective measures and some real data and some cutting edge analysis and figure out what the best opportunity for the limited resources and limited space in the corridor is so that we can design a transit solution for the future. And while we all have our favorites, it's impossible to know what the good answers are gonna be, but hopefully we will by next fall. Any other comments on this item? 
Um, well, I, I appreciate the analysis again, and I know staff took an action item to give us some some numbers on light rail, uh, net, as well as max, as well as peak, just depending on space and station. I, I just want to make sure that we do that. I'd, I'd mm -hmm. request that we also do that for buses um, traveling in a BRT mode. That means right where you have um, a, a Jim, bus that continues like a vehicle in the corridor it, and doesn't have to deviate. Jim on took a bunch of notes, and so I'm assuming we're going to get so a just, table. I, well, I just that, wanted to make sure that, talks, that bus was one of those modes. Yeah, but I think what we want is a table that has the various modes that we see as yeah. viable. And so it's, it's local express and BRT, and it's dedicated guideway, and it's corporate bus, and it's, right, you'll, right. Go, you'll go through some of these and coalesce them, uh, and light rail. Right. So that we, so, so that so I we just wanted give. to make sure that we were generalizing this and not focusing solely yep. on the light, particular light rail technology that we've employed in the valley to date. Any other comments about the whole meeting about this item? Let's close item number nine. Uh, next up would be announcements. Any announcements? Seeing none, we will call this meeting adjourned. I want to thank everybody for coming. Great.